Natalie McLean writes about wine. She's written books about wine. Her newest is uh, titled Unquenchable, a tipsy quest for the world's best bargain wines. She also puts out a weekly newsletter, which I enjoy when it uh, arrives on my computer. Uh, she's in the studio with me now. Hi. Hey, Bill. Unquenchable. Mm. You did a lot of research. I did. I'm thoroughly hedonistic. <laughs> <laughs> What a job. I know. It's a good gig, yeah. Tell, me, tell me where you went. Well, every chapter, there are eight of them, is a different country. And so I went all around the world, South Africa, Argentina, Portugal, uh, Sicily, Niagara, um, Provence, all over the place, just searching for those good bargain wines. And did you find some surprises? I did. I did. Well, you know, it really, in the past when someone asked me, you know, can you get a great wine for less than 20 bucks? My answer was usually, non less all you want is a wet tongue. But, you know, I think this journey really did prove to me that, that wine doesn't have to be expensive to taste great. There are so many factors coming to play uh, today. It's never been a better time to be a wine consumer. You can get great bottles in that, you know, 10 to $15 range. Well, and you mentioned Argentina. Uh-huh. And Argentina and Chile... Um, I think are two of the places that are producing some pretty robust big wines yes. uh, at, well, well under $20. They are. And, you know, there's a, a few factors that go into that. They, Their land is cheap. Their labor cost is low. They have sunny weather every year, so they're not battling, you know, pests and rot and all that sort of thing that a cooler climate would. Um, but And they're also trying to make a mark in the, the market. So w- with Argentina, they don't have a brand name grape like Cabernet. Well, they, they do make it, but their flagship is Malbec. And so for all those reasons, you're going to pay a lot less for a, a Malbec from Argentina. But isn't a Malbec pretty similar to a Cab? It is. It's it's the same thing, really. I mean, you know, if you like robust and luscious and, and smooth, it's it's a terrific wine. You mentioned Portugal. Mm-hmm, yes. Well, in Portugal's case, what they, they've always been known for the dessert wine, the fortified dessert wine that uh, is nice at the end of dinner. But they're trying to make a reputation now for dry table wines. So you've got a country that's a very traditional wine-producing country trying to establish a new reputation for dry table wines. You're going to find bargains there, too. Is France still it? Is it still the home of the really great wine? It is. But if you go down south, which is another sort of insider tip trying to find these bargain wines, you will find deals. So Bordeaux and Burgundy are benchmark and they're expensive. But if you go down to Languedoc or even Provence for the dry rosé, that's where you're going to find the deals. You mentioned Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just South Africa? South Africa, yeah. yes. and uh, They have some great wines. They do. Um, they do Shiraz and Sauvignon Blanc really well. And in this case, you know, they were off the market for a while with apartheid, so they're trying to put their reputation back on and establish, you know, that they produce good wines because um, pre-apartheid, the wines were really grim. So that always helps when a country is trying to recover from a bad reputation. Germany is another one. You know, that's syrupy stuff you might have had behind the high school portable. <laughs> um, but they, they've come a long way. Too. Well, you'd have to say the same thing about Canada, wouldn't you? I mean, you we would. had a pretty bad reputation. We had our zoological period, Gimli Goose and uh, Baby uh, Duck. Baby <laughs> Duck. <laughs> yeah. Duck is that, Canadian? that was grim, yeah. Um, but now, uh, Ontario mm-hmm. and I think British Columbia together absolutely compete very well. Uh, I think a lot of British Columbia wines, and, and I don't pretend any expertise, uh, but with all the com- pair favorably with a lot of the um, California wines. They do. And, you know, when I look at uh, both um, BC and uh, Ontario, we excel at Pinot Noir, which is called the heartbreak grape. It's expensive to make and gross. It's never going to be cheap. Our Pinot Noirs are world class, but they start maybe at $20 a bottle. But they are bargains because if you compare that to Burgundy, France, home of Pinot Noir, you're going to start at double, triple the cost. So bargain to me doesn't mean absolute cheapest. It means that price-quality ratio is amazing. We also are famous for our um, 
Ice wines. Yes. D- fabulous dessert wines. Um, does, anybody else make, does anybody else make ice wine? Germany does, but they uh, they don't have as cold winters as we do. So that's, I guess, one benefit of being a lot colder on average than any other country. So we produce ice wine consistently, vintage after vintage. We're the world's largest producer in Canada of ice wine. And then, so ice wine isn't cheap. You get a half bottle, three, 375 mil for 40, 45. That's the starting price. Yeah. But then compare that to so turn you know the chateau kim from bordeaux again double triple for what you get in the bottle talking with natalie mclean her new book is unquenchable she's also going to be uh, back here on the 21st at uh, the beautiful fairmont uh, hotel pacific rim doing a wine and cheese night that's uh, monday november 21st from seven till nine your uh, tickets are 90 dollars, but that includes wine cheese and a signed copy of the book. That's right. We're going to be sampling lots of different wines and cheese combinations, so it should be a lot of fun. So you can go to www.ticketweb.ca to uh, get more information on that. You're also going to be going to Whistler. Absolutely, for Cornucopia. That's tomorrow, so heading up there. I'm very excited about that and doing more wine tasting. We're always combining wine and words. (laughs) We'll be back uh, with your calls, I hope, at 604-280-9898. Anything you want to know about wine. Toll free one eight seven seven three nine nine ninety eight ninety eight. Your calls to Natalie McLean right after this. Talking uh, wine with Natalie McLean, and I welcome your calls to her. Don't be afraid; she's not scary. Six zero four two eight zero nine eight nine eight. If you want to know about wine, or if you want to share some of your uh, thoughts on wine, her new book is titled Unquenchable. We talked a little bit about uh, wine in uh, British Columbia, wine in Ontario. I'm not uh, as familiar with Ontario, but the wine has become a big business in British Columbia. It's also become a a very important part of our tourist industry. A lot of people taking wine tours uh, in the Okanagan, and there are some brilliant wineries in the Okanagan now. Oh, there are. I mean, it's a, it's a perfect vacation if you love food or wine, and, and you certainly don't have to be an expert in either because the, the number and diversity of wineries, um, many of them have rest, great restaurants attached to them, so you get the food and wine pairing aspect as well. And, you know, I, I haven't been to a grim wine region yet. They're usually beautiful, you know, yeah. very nice climate. Uh, it's the reason I don't write about plumbing parts and tour, you know, dusty factories. But, you know, a wine country vacation is, is terrific. And uh, they've really smartened up in recent years. I mean, it used to be that you could go to a winery, but you couldn't buy wine or you couldn't get a meal right. at, the, at the winery, which no, was yeah. just plain stupid. But it, they finally, you know, woke up and, just, you know, determined that there was a real industry to be to be had there. Absolutely. Hospitality is now a big part of it. Um, some of them even have, like, inns or hotels, yeah. and you get the whole package. Now, you were uh, talk- we were talking uh, during the break about how uh, – the Internet, how online has really changed people's ability to, to learn about, about wine. Absolutely, um, especially with you know, the, um, Twitter and Facebook. I think people can slide into wine and, and learning about wine in a far less intimidating way these days. I know um, on Twitter, uh, I almost think of it as my wine channel because all we do is trade wine recommendations. You know, what did you have last night? What goes with the you know, chicken or whatever? And if anybody wants to find me, I'm at Natalie McLean, which is the same as my website, nataliemclean.com. But I find that people feel less intimidated when they can and kind of ask a question, and they're not standing face-to-face with someone in a liquor store or looking up at a sommelier. It's just, it's a, it's a great medium, and you can stay high level. I like this wine. What do you like? Or you can take the deep dive and really learn about a particular region or wine on a website. It was, uh, I was just thinking about a friend of mine who was wanting to take a course to be a sommelier just for fun. Yes. I had no intention of doing it for a living, but he just thought it would be a, you know, a fun thing to do in an interesting way. You also mentioned wine pairings. I'm always curious about that. Um, you, I'm obviously you believe in it. You give some uh, some examples, but how do you how do you decide what? Just give me some examples of what how you decide what to pair with what. Um, I start off with you know just a very simple guideline. You're looking at flavor, texture, and weight. So if you've got a big honkin' Australian Shiraz in your glass, you're probably wanting something robust and equally flavorful on the plate, like a a juicy steak. 
similarly, if you've got, uh, you know, a, a sole light fish dish, you probably want a zippy little Riesling. So, you know, they're just very basic guidelines. But we've gone way beyond, you know, red wine, red meat, white wine, yeah. white meat. It's, it is what you like. I mean, the best pairing is between you and the wine you like. And if it doesn't work out as a food pairing, have a bun instead or whatever. Don't get too uptight about it. But the fun is in experimenting. And, and that's, that's what I think people can really enjoy. Is there a difference between a Pinot Gris and a Pinot Grigio? Yes, yeah. It, What's the difference? Well, you know, they're they're closely related. Um, Pinot Grigio, the home, is in Italy, and they tend to be a little bit more full-bodied. There'll be a bit more alcohol to them. Pinot Gris tends to be lighter. It's made in, in many different regions. Um, but they're both refreshing white wines that go well with, like, a wide variety from seafood to salad to, you know, nice aperitif on their own. But I find the Pinot Grigios have a bit more heft to them. But it, that's Italian. Yes, that's Italian. So yes. if it says Pinot Grigio... It's Italian. It's not always Italian. You know, Pinot Grigio is made in other regions, but the home of Pinot Grigio okay. is Italian. Yes. Okay. You were also saying that, uh, I was kidding, what was the movie Sideways? Right. Gave uh, Merlot a bit of a bad rap a, a, a few years ago. Poor Merlot. Well, Still that surprised recovering. me because I, I actually like a Merlot. Oh, there's nothing wrong with Merlot. It's just Miles had that problem with it. It's, you know, uh, people seem to think of Merlot as the smooth jazz of wine, like too nondescript or too inoffensive. But Merlot can be juicy, wonderful, robust, smooth wine, and there's nothing wrong with it. But they made a documentary to respond to it called Merlot. Yeah, all the Merlot people got really upset, but it just hasn't had the impact of sideways. You also said that there are ways of kind of uh, uh, getting around. If, if you like a Merlot but you find it's a bit pricey, there are alternatives if you get to know what the other names are. Exactly. So that's a kind of insider tip for finding bargain wines. Carmen Yer from Chile it comes originally from Bordeaux and the Merlot grape st- or rootstock. It's the same sort of clonal cousin. So if you go for uh, Carmen Yer from oh, a lot of different wineries in Chile, Santa Carolina, Santa Rita, and so on, you're going to pay about... Twelve, fourteen dollars, and you're getting what is essentially a beautiful Merlot taste, maybe even a bit more robust. How would you describe the difference between what people call old world and new world wines? Hard to categorize, but if I had to, I would say old world is uh, less upfront fruity, probably a bit more acidity. Don't be afraid of acidity. Acidity is to wine what salt is to food. It brings forward flavor. Um, and But, you know, new world, um, so we're talking California, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, Canada, uh, has a bit more of those vibrant fu- fruit flavors, not as much of that mouth-watering juiciness. You're making me very thirsty. I'm doing my job then. Good thing lunch is just around the corner. <laughs> Thanks for doing this. And a reminder that uh, Natalie will be available for the wine and cheese night with Natalie McLean at uh, the beautiful Fairmont uh, Hotel Pacific Rim. That's uh, Monday the 21st from 7 till 9 if you want more information on that. Uh, ticketweb.ca. I'm Bill Good, and we'll be back uh, with Karen uh, Horak to find out what uh, you've been telling us on Twitter and Facebook and uh, email and uh, even sometimes listener line. Back right